Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, wonderful to see you here this morning. Isn't this a great, a great sight? I don't know if you've all been to the Cove before, but I'm glad UCI has this place. I'm glad uh, Richard Sudek is heading it, and, and he and the Chancellor are building this bridge to the community. Um, we've had lots of links to the community, but this one is, an, is, is a very important one and a useful one. Um, let me recognize a couple of people in the room. Let me recognize Kate Klimau, who is the uh, Associate Vice VP for Public Affairs and Chief of Staff. A couple of our department chairs, Karen Rook and Cheryl Maxson. And all the people associated with the change, eight change makers. They have uh, logos on their name tags. If, if you could just put your hand up quickly so people know who, that you're here. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, the change makers, by the way, is the... The Change Makers is the is it's, it's a very important organization that provides uh, support through the contributions of its members to the School of Social Ecology, and allow and, and support which is used for both fellowships and 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 scholarships and all sorts of interesting opportunities for our students, but also for faculty research, and it allows the dean to take advantage of opportunities that come up during the year. So we're we're very grateful for that. One of the things that it supports is is today's program, Daybreak Dialogues. And this is the very first session we're kicking that, this program off, and I'm delighted to be able to, to do that. My name is Richard Matthew. I'm an Associate Dean in the School of Social Ecology, and I direct the Blum Center for Poverty Alleviation. And today's topic is a, is, is a wonderful fit, a wonderful way to start this program off. It was about a year ago, a very close friend of mine was hired by a very large automobile um, company, to set up a think tank, a very heavily funded think tank, to look at just one question, the implications of driverless cars over the next few years. That was about the same time that, that uh, Michael Bloomberg in, in New York argued that this was happening. You know, there's, there's something like 100 and, or $80 billion of investment into driverless cars right now through 160 different partnerships and programs in, in, in the world. He said, this is going to happen, but almost no, no city in the country or in the world is preparing uh, for this change or thinking it through. And he offered, he, he offered a set of guidelines to help cities think about this. Yesterday, I want to get the, the name right. Ye yesterday, to, to give you a sense of how timely this topic is, the Global Atlas of Autonomous Vehicles um, in Cities went live for the first time. And it shows us where driverless cars are being used around the world. And it turns out that they are being piloted in just 35 cities, only 11 in the United States, even though people feel this is going to potentially be revolutionary in the transportation sector. So, you know, and, and, and much of the focus of, of, of these pilot studies has been on, will this relieve congestion? Will it improve air quality? Um, you know, and, and, and what are the barriers to adoption? But there's a much bigger set of issues to be thinking about. And that brings me to today's speaker. Um, so Azim Sharif is an associate professor in the uh, Department of Psychology and Social Behavior. He received his PhD at the University of British Columbia. And his, and he, and his work focuses on moral, different aspects of moral psychology. It's appeared both in top academic journals like Sciences and Trends in Cognitive Science, but he's also received considerable coverage in mainstream media, places like The Economist, The New Scientist, New York Times. He's been recognized by his peers in 2012. He was awarded the Margaret Gorman Early Career Award from the American Psychological Association. His work on some of the implications of technology has far-reaching implications, and, um, and I think that we, we will all be interested to hear about him discuss some of the trade-offs that we may not have fully considered as we move towards uh, a society of an economy of driverless cars. So please join me in welcoming Professor Azim Sharif. Thank you, Richard. Is this on? You guys can hear me? Nope. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming uh, uh, this early today. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be here at, at UCI. So I am actually relatively new here. I've been here for a year. Uh, before I was here, I spent six years at the University of Oregon, which is in uh, quaint and rainy Eugene, Oregon. And uh, everything, almost everything, is better here. 
So uh, the weather is better here and the food is better here. The university is better. My colleagues are better. But it's almost everything. Because there is one thing that even though I was warned many times, I was not prepared for. And that was this. So I have spent, in the year I've been here, more time in my car than I did in the entire six years that I was at the University of Oregon. There I had a uh, seven minute commute on my bike. And it turns out that it was my experience in Oregon that was aberrant. And this is the norm for Americans. Americans spend a lot of time in their car. 27,375 days. That's how many days we get on the planet as Americans. The average American will live for 27,375 days. How do we spend that time? So the average American will spend 273 days reading for pleasure. They'll spend, out of this 27,375 days, they'll spend 180 days exercising. They'll spend 117 days having sex. And <laughs> because you guys know how charts work, you know that this is going to be a very large number now. 1,581 days. That's how much time we spend in our cars. So for those of you guys who went to a, a four-year university, think about those four years that you spent there. Think about uh, that life-changing experience, all those eye-opening classes and those nights with your friends. And many people think of this as uh, the greatest time of their lives. Think about even just the mundane days and the boring classes. Think about those four years, all of it, all the stuff you went through and you will spend more time in your car than you did at university. That's a lot of time. And it wouldn't be such a bad thing if commuting was great, if people enjoyed commuting, but they do not. Uh, commuting is about the worst part of most Americans' day. So this is a paper uh, that was uh, published by uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist, uh, Daniel Kahneman, and he looked at the various activities and ranked them by how happy people were or how unhappy people were when they were doing these activities. And you can see that commuting is right there at the bottom. It is the worst thing that we do, the thing that has the greatest negative effect on our happiness. And you can see right at the top, there's intimate relations. And so you can see how backwards we are in our priorities here. And you can think that man, if we could just take some of this time, if we could just take some of these 1,581 days and sprinkle it in these other categories, how much smarter and how much fitter and how much happier we would be if we spent that time doing those other things. Not that we necessarily would spend the time doing those things, but we could. Now, commuting has such a large negative effect on our happiness because it's one of those things that we don't really adapt to. If you buy a big house, it'll make you happy for a bit, and then you will come back to baseline. If you uh, move to a nicer neighborhood, same thing, you'll be happy for a bit, you come back to baseline. We tend to come back to baseline but, uh, as a result of both positive and negative things. We come back to a homostasis. But commuting is one of those things that we don't get, uh, we don't return to baseline for. Commuting will have a significant and lasting negative effect on people's happiness. And so uh, some uh, Swedish economists did an analysis where they looked at the opportunity costs. How much would you need to make to return your well-being to a level that it would exist if you weren't commuting? And they found that for somebody who made $60,000 to offset the negative well-being impact of commuting, they would need to get a $40,000 raise. So they would have to go up to $100,000 to break even in terms of well-being. So, commuting, it's bad. And that's if everything works. Of course, we know that it doesn't always. So, driving is a form of casual carnage that we've just gotten used to. So, if you look at the um, uh, amount of fatalities that occur from various causes. So, mass shootings, which is something we talk about a lot, 
in uh, this year, 2015, which is last year we had complete data for all of these things, 472 people died from mass shootings. From gun homicides in general, you saw 13,000 people die. From the opioid crisis that we hear so much about, that did kill a lot of people. So that was 33,000 people. Uh, but 35,000 people in that year died on the road. And this number, which had been falling for decades, over the last few years has been ticking back upwards. So last year, over 40,000 Americans died. And one of the reasons is that now we have texting, and that's actually pushed this number back up a little bit. And so 40,000 people died, a uh, 100 times that get injured every year. So this is carnage, but it's carnage that we've just gotten used to. It's carnage that we tend to tolerate for some reason. For some reason, if there was an opioid crisis or if there was a shooting crisis, we would talk a lot about it, but for some reason we don't tend to talk about the massive impact that this has on our lives. So here's another way of quantifying this. Let's talk about it in terms of dollars. So the upper estimates for the cost of those traffic accidents in terms of medical expenses and lost productivity is $836 billion. Now, for reference, that's just a bit larger than the GDP of the state of Texas. My own calculations, back of the envelope calculations, put the value of the man hours that are spent commuting at just under $2 trillion. So if you add these up, you get to somewhere just under $3 trillion. Now that is uh, just slightly larger than the GDP of Great Britain, which means that Americans spend on driving, not on cars, but just on driving, the equivalent to the entire economic output of the fifth largest economy in the world. That's how much we spend. And you consider that with the lives and the well-being cost. And then you think about, well, what if I told you that there was a better way? And this is the transformational promise of self-driving cars. They promise to be uh, more efficient and definitely more convenient, and though there's still debate about this, cleaner, and they promise to be safer. So again, there's still debate about how, how safe they will be, how fast they will get there, but the most frequently cited estimate, which is from McKinsey a few years ago, is that once they are at the point where they need to be, they will reduce traffic uh, fatalities by 90%. So we will go from 35,000 to 3,500, which is a substantial reduction. But it doesn't reduce it down to zero. There will still be some accidents. And it's within those accidents, within those remaining accidents, where we see some thorny moral dilemmas. So, when we drive as humans, we're not just making uh, a bunch of tactical and planning decisions. We're constantly making ethical decisions, even though we don't often think of them in that way and we don't realize we're making them. When you decide uh, how fast you're going to drive or uh, how much space you're going to give the people in front of you and behind you, or where you are laterally in your lane, whether you're driving a little closer to the cyclist on your left or driving a little closer to the big semi-truck on your right, those are ethical decisions which distribute risk in different ways. They distribute risk between you, the passenger, and the different stakeholders on the road, the cyclist and the semi. Uh, and at their most extreme and rare situations, you can see uh, these ethical trade-offs being made. So if you are heading towards an oncoming uh, collision, if you're about to run into a tree, uh, do you swerve right and take the brunt of the impact yourself or do you swerve left and put the brunt of the impact on your passenger that's an ethical decision but it's one that we make based on instinct in a split second and as a result we don't really hold each other so morally accountable for making that decision we recognize that in the in the frailty of human experience well they just made that instant like instantly they just made that decision instantly and as a result they don't they aren't held completely morally accountable but when those decisions are made 
in advance, not in the heat of the moment, and when they're made by car manufacturers, not by the drivers themselves, then this calculus changes a little bit. Because now, with those decisions programmed into the cars themselves, we have the luxury of deliberation. And with the luxury of deliberation comes the responsibility of deliberation. Now we really have to think carefully about the ethical trade-offs that are being made in those situations. We have to make explicit those moral quandaries that are just implicit when any of us are driving. And so that's when we run into the ethical dilemma. So when you're trying to understand an ethical trade-off, it's useful to use thought experiments, stylized, simplified, stark thought experiments that put an ethical trade-off very clearly in front of you. And so I'll give you an example. This is a very famous example. This is uh, uh, the trolley problem that was um, first uh, uh, imagined by the British philosopher Philippa Foote, and she put people in this situation. Now, how many of you uh, have heard of the trolley problem before? Okay, not everybody, so I will describe it. So the idea is that, th let's see if I can use this thing. This, okay, doesn't matter. You are the guy by the lever. Uh, so you can see here, that's you by the lever. There's a runaway trolley which is speeding down the track. Its brakes have failed, it cannot stop. On the track in front of it are five workers. Now, right now, if you do nothing, it will impact the five workers. You have the opportunity to pull the lever, which will flip a switch, which puts it on the other track where there's just a single worker. So you have the option to keep it on the track where it'll kill five, or to flip it onto a switch where it'll kill one. So how many of you say that you should leave it where it is? You should choose this option. Hands up, actually. This is audience participation time. So how many of you guys say that we should leave it? And how many of you say we should flip the switch? Okay, that's what most people say. Here's a variant. So this was uh, proposed by uh, Judith Thomas Thompson, uh, who was an American philosopher. And this is the footbridge problem. So now, instead of you having a lever, you're on a bridge. And the runaway trolley is coming straight down. There's no track to put it off. It's right now going to head into these five people. But there is a very large man in front of you. And you know that this man is girthsome enough that he will be able to stop the trolley before it can impact the workers, though it will kill him. And, and you're too small to do it yourself, so you can't jump yourself. But you can push the man. So how many of you would push the large man off the footbridge? Hands up. Okay. Okay. So, they say that behind every living person is a dead philosopher. So the, the two philosophers that are most associated with these two options here, uh, on the one hand is Jeremy Bentham. And uh, these were the options uh, on the right the whole time, which is that you could take the utilitarian approach. And most of you took the utilitarian approach in the first instance, which is five is more than one, and therefore if I can save five lives, well, it's worth sacrificing one. Of course, you didn't decide to do that when it became the, the large man on the footbridge problem, because there's other philosophical commitments here. And this is uh, 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 usually associated with Immanuel Kant, the deontological approach that there are rules, and we don't violate those rules even if the consequences of those rules uh, might be preferable. So this is a situation you will not find yourself in. This is a very comical, stylized situation, but what it does is it makes clear the ethical trade-off between these two philosophical approaches. And so what we wanted to do is try to make similar ethical trade-offs that will occur with self-driving cars clear by presenting these types of ethical dilemmas to people. And so this is the one that we came up with. So here's your road, here's your self-driving car. There's one person in this car. And in front of you, two people, or really just any number more than one person show up. And for some reason, and it doesn't matter why, the car cannot stop. The brakes fail, it's going too fast, whatever. There are two options, either the car can swerve into the side of the road, hitting a barrier, going off a, 
off the side of the road into a river, doesn't matter. Whatever, the bit that matters is that the passenger dies. So it can swerve, killing the passenger, or it can stay and kill the two pedestrians. And the question that we wanted to answer is, if these cars are coming, if self-driving cars are coming down the pike, what kind of car do people want? And so it's that question that my collaborators, uh, Iyad Rahwan, who's a computer scientist at MIT, and Jean-Francois Bonafont, who's a social psychologist uh, in the economics department at the University of Toulouse, we published this paper asking this question. And I'm going to tell you guys the results in a bit, but first I want to tell you about another venue where we asked this question. So uh, time to coincide with the publication of this paper, we also made a website uh, called uh, The Moral Machine. And in The Moral Machine, what it does is it pr produces these pseudo-random scenarios where people, uh, just people who are at home, uh, made to look like a bit of a web game, people can go on and they can make decisions on the ethical trade-offs that these cars are making. And to make it gamified, to make it more fun, we had different characters in it, so sometimes you can save four dogs by killing five cats or something. Uh, in this case, you have uh, two normal people, and you have uh, a bank robber and a homeless man who are crossing, but they're jaywalking. And so the decision is, well, should the car swerve to hit them? Or should it stay on its path and sacrifice the passengers? And, well, you can, you, all you have to do is click on one or the other and decide what it should do. And, um, like I said, we, we, we designed this to launch right when the paper was published, expecting that we could drive maybe uh, five or 10,000 people who are reading the paper to the website. But the website, for whatever reason, probably because these sort of ethical dilemmas are such effective brain teasers, uh, it took off. Uh, it was way more po uh, popular than we, we possibly imagined. Uh, so we, we ultimately ended up translating it into 10 languages. Uh, and we had uh, just under, thus far we it's still running, we have uh, just under 4 million unique users with uh, 37 million um, single ethical decisions uh, from 204 countries, uh, which pr gives us actually a lot of data to look at what people's preferences are and actually how they might differ between countries. Um, we even had some internet celebrities play this. So, uh, all right, hands up. How many of you guys know who PewDiePie is? Okay, so if you were born uh, uh, before, say, 1999, uh, you probably don't know don't know who PewDiePie is, but he's actually the most subscribed to a uh, YouTuber on the internet. Uh, he basically posts videos of his life or him just surfing the internet and millions of people will watch this. And so one day he decided to spend 10 minutes playing with the moral machine and millions of people watched it. Um, uh, you guys might be more familiar uh, with uh, uh, this guy uh, who also, uh, in maybe a career highlight, brought up our study in an interview that he gave uh, for Wired magazine. And he said, I'll spare you my Barack Obama impression. <laughs> I was going to do it, but now I'm chickening out. Okay, so he said, and imagine this in the Obama voice, uh, if the car is driving, you can swerve to avoid hitting a pedestrian, but then you might hit a wall and kill yourself. It's a moral decision. And uh, who's, who's setting up those rules? Um, all right. So who indeed? Today it's going to be you, because uh, we're going to do a few scenarios from the moral machine. So I'm going to get your, your voting in on these. And so the first one is this one. So let me explain what's going on, because it might be a little hard for you guys to see. But this is just two people and two people. Everybody's the same here. The car can either, and it has to do one of these two things, it can either drive into the barrier, killing the two people, the two passengers in the car, or it can swerve to kill the two people that are walking. It has to do one of these things. So who thinks it should just stay on its path and sacrifice the passengers? Hands up. All right, and who thinks that it should swerve and hit the pedestrians? All right, so, so some, some in each group, it seems like we had maybe about twice as many uh, saying that it should just stay on its current path and shouldn't, shouldn't engage in any action uh, of, of uh, commission to hit the, the uh, other passengers. Pedestrians. Uh, that's about what we found on the moral machine. So this is crunching uh, uh, 
thousands and millions of data points. Uh, what you guys said actually maps on pretty well to what the millions of people on the moral machine said. Let's try another one. Okay, here you have a little boy. You have a little boy and you have an older, regular aged man uh, and there's nobody in the car. So the car is just driving itself and it has to kill one of these people. So it has to go either straight and run over the little boy or it has to turn and run over the man. Who says it should just continue straight? Okay, one, one person. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's the Kantian. All right, and, and uh, who says it, it should swerve and kill the man? Okay, okay. So uh, you guys were actually more stark in this than we find, found on the moral machine, possibly because your decisions were visible to everybody else in this room, and uh, uh, you didn't want to appear <laughs> like somebody who would kill the kid. Fair enough. Okay. What about this? Now what we've done is we've introduced uh, jogging and we've also introduced uh, breaking the law. So you have uh, one guy who's crossing at the green, he's not breaking the law, uh, and then you have one guy who's jogging, but is jogging at a red light where he shouldn't be. So he's J jogging. Um, so that should the car go straight, stay on its course, kill the man who's uh, walking legally, or should it swerve and kill the jogger? Uh, so who says kill the jogger? And who says stay straight? Interesting. Okay. Okay. Again, pretty close to what the moral machine found there. Okay, this last one's the hardest. <sighs> Same deal, except instead of one jogger, you have two walkers. So you have two people who are breaking the law. So you can either kill two people who are breaking the law, or you kill one person who's abiding by the law. So now you've pit two, two uh, uh, ethical positions against each other. So who says that it should continue straight and kill the one person? All right, and who says it should swerve and kill the two people who are breaking the law? All right, so that's about 50-50. That's about what we found on the moral machine. Uh, so you can see the kind of law of large numbers emerging here, right? So, so this, is, this, I think, is an interesting thing because you have a trade-off between two values. You have the utilitarian value and you have the rule of law value. And what we find is that actually there are places, so in Germany, uh, we were presenting these data and all the Germans say, kill the jaywalkers. <laughs> Sorry, all the Germans say, save the person who's following the law. That's a better way of putting it. So when, when you crunch all these numbers together, uh, this is what you find. You find that, that you do have people electing to preserve certain ethical commitments over other ones. Uh, so here's three of them. So saving more lives seems to matter a lot. If you, by the way, if you do uh, uh, the moral machine uh, on your own time and you do 13 scenarios, it, it spits out your own uh, score on these various ethical positions. Um, uh, but once we crunch all the data, you find that utilitarianism matters a lot. People want to save more people than they want to sacrifice. Uh, protecting the passenger doesn't seem to matter that much. So people are not preferentially saying, well, if the person's a passenger, then we should save them and sacrifice the pedestrian. And then upholding the law seems to matter a lot. So people want to, people uh, are, are consigned to sacrificing uh, jaywalkers if it means saving people who are abiding by the law. So that's similar to what we found when we actually ran the studies before we launched the Moral Machine and we were actually just conducting these studies uh, with our study participants. We found that if you gave people this scenario, we had uh, 10 pedestrians and one passenger and the idea is, well, should the car swerve and sacrifice the passenger or should it stay and sacrifice the 10 pedestrians. So a lot more people than are in the car. Uh, and we asked people, well, what kind of car do you want? What kind of car is more ethical? And there it was very clear. We had uh, overwhelming uh, agreement that, well, the car should operate in the utilitarian way. That's the ethical thing that it should do. So Jeremy Bentham wins, and people overwhelmingly recognize the utilitarian car to be more ethical. But we also asked them an additional question which is, uh, what, which car would you buy? <laughs> yeah. 
And there, <laughs> there was a strong preference for the one that was self-protective. Now, I think this is very interesting because usually people try to convince themselves that there are people who do ethical things, but here what they're doing is they're telling us very clearly that they would buy the car they perceive to be unethical were they to choose it. And it makes sense, right? You can understand why. You can't blame these people so much. This is, as far as I can think, it's the first consumer product that could be designed to, in certain situations, harm, deliberately harm, the person who owns it. I don't think there's anything else like that. Actually, I was talking to Jason about this before. The only other product that I can think is like that is S&M gear. But for S&M gear, you, you want to be hurt, whereas in this case, you don't. And I think that's a brand new category of things that hasn't existed uh, before. And that's what happens when you yield autonomy to these things, when you imbue things with artificial intelligence and say that the ethical decisions that we're always making, well, now they have to be made by a machine. And so you can't blame these people, but it does cause problems. And so here what we find is that the ethical dilemma that we've been talking about reveals another dilemma, which is a social dilemma. So a social dilemma is something that psychologists and economists and biologists talk about in which you have a group and individuals have the opportunity to free ride on the group. And it's in the interest of every single individual to free ride on the group unless everybody does it and then everybody is worse off as a result. And so let me give you some examples to make this more concrete. So the most famous example uh, was suggested by the biologist Garrett Hardin, which is the tragedy of the commons, something you guys may have heard about before. So in the tragedy of the commons, you have a commons, you have a common good. Say it's a grazing land. This was the example that he gave. You have grazing land and you have a bunch of herders and they have a bunch of sheep and so long as each herder has one sheep, well, that's sustainable for the amount of land that you have. But it's within every herder's interest to have more sheep. And if there's 100 herders and one's thinking, well, we all just have one sheep, if I had two sheep, I could, two sheep, I could double my profits. And the cost of having that extra sheep would be distributed among the other 99 people. So it's a big benefit for me, but it's only a tiny marginal cost for any individual purpose, person, other, any individual other person. The problem is that everybody's tempted to do that. And if everybody did that, well, then you reach a point where it's now unsustainable for the commons. And so you see this in overfishing. If everybody fished to a sustainable level, we'd be fine. The fish stocks would uh, uh, stay uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, but if people overfish, if every individual gives into their temptation to take a little bit more for themselves, the fish stocks get depleted. We see this in pollution. We see this in all manner of things. This is a, a common problem, the tragedy of the commons. Now, uh, another example is the public goods dilemma. So, whereas in the... Uh, tragedy of the commons, it's all about people wanting to take a little more. In a public goods dilemma, it's all about people wanting to give a little less. So a public good is something that could be uh, produced which would benefit everybody if they had it. And so you could think of this in terms of, uh, you could think of this as a road or a lighthouse. If everybody contributed just a little bit, everybody would be able to use the collective product, uh, the pub public good that was developed everybody could use that road. And so it's in everybody's interest to actually pull together the resources to do this. But any single individual is better off if they use the road without contributing anything to it. If everybody else contributes and I don't, well, the road will still exist and I can still use it. So every individual is tempted to do that. And if every individual gives into that temptation and doesn't give anything, well, the consequence is that the road never gets built. And so every individual is worse off as a result. And so in the case of the cars, everybody seems to agree that the utilitarian car is the ethical car. That's the ideal future we'd want to head to, where we have cars that treat everybody equally, and as a result, we maximize safety. But nobody seems to want to pay the small personal cost to their own safety in order to bring that, that ideal future about. And so that is a social dilemma. So how do you solve this? What's our solution? What do we do about this? So 
I'm Canadian, and the Canadian in me saw an obvious answer here. This is government regulation. <laughs> That's how we do it. That's how we build roads, right? We tax people and we force them to pay. That's how we regulate uh, commons. We give regulations, so why wouldn't we do this? We'll just regulate that these cars should be utilitarian. But our studies were done on Americans, and Americans absolutely hated this idea. If there's one thing that they hated more than buying a utilitarian car, it was buying a car that was regulated by the government to be utilitarian. They absolutely hated this idea. They much preferred that you leave that option uh, to consumer choice and to what the car manufacturers decide to market. So, what do the car manufacturers decide to market? They've been asked this question, and most of them, I think wisely, and you'll see why, uh, have decided to not answer this question. They found creative ways of just avoiding the answer. So Volvo, for instance, said, oh, well, our cars will just never crash. <laughs> Problem solved. Okay, that was actually a smart answer. Uh, one car company, Mercedes, did warrant, uh, they, they hazarded an answer. So, so one of their um, uh, executives, the guy who works on safety for self-driving cars, uh, uh, was asked at a car show, given this scenario, what would you do? And he gave an answer which suggested somewhat obliquely, well, uh, we build our cars for our consumers, and so if you have the opportunity, you save the consumer, you save the passenger. So we would choose the cars which were self-protective. And again, that makes sense. If you are a private company who's trying to sell cars, it makes sense that you appeal to your consumers. And yet, two weeks later, they did a complete 180 on this. So now Mercedes says its driverless cars won't run over pedestrians. That would be illegal. <laughs> now, the reason they went from here to here was because in the interim time, there was outrage on the internet. So this is a Daily Mail passage. So, so this, is the, this is what they got from that. Mercedes-Benz admits automated driverless cars would run over a child rather than swerve and risk injuring the passengers inside. So somehow from that statement, they got that conclusion. And there was so much outrage from people on the internet that they realized that they can't just appeal to their consumers, that there's another side to this question, that there are other stakeholders on the road, and that if they hew too close to the self-protective cars, they risk public outrage. But if they hew too close to the utilitarian cars, then nobody will buy the cars themselves. And so car companies face a dilemma here as well. They have to decide, maybe, they're faced with the decision of whether to make these cars unpopular to the masses, in which case you risk public outrage, or unpopular to the consumers, in which case you go out of business. And from the car companies I've talked to, they would like nothing more than to have this decision taken out of their hands. They actually want government regulation so that they are not held accountable for making this decision. Okay, well, that's fine, but that introduces another problem. And this is what we call the meta-ethical dilemma. So it's fine if we manage to regulate these cars and we say that they must be utilitarian. The problem with that is that in the other cases where you're regulating a social dilemma, so in the case where you're requiring people to pay taxes to build a road, that's fine because people don't have the option not to pay the taxes. They have to pay the tax under penalty of law. But if you say, well, only utilitarian cars can exist, People have the option to just not buy those cars. And if they don't buy those cars, they stick with the current cars that they have. And if they stick with the current cars that they have, the ones we drive, then you're stuck with this, this casual everyday carnage that we have. So 100 Americans dead every single day, 10,000 Americans dead, no, 10,000 Americans injured every single day. And all that time that could be better spent reading and exercising and loving each other. Not that we would spend our time that way, but that we could. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm open to your questions.
I can, I can do it. Uh, uh, so what we need to mic the, yeah. We have a, a beach ball mic. So uh, what we're going to do is we have, a, we have 15 minutes. First of all, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I, and I wonder if the cyanide capsule is another example of a product given to people. Oh, excellent example. To That's do right. damage to them. And it must have, it must have uh, if, you, if you were given one during the Cold War as a spy, yeah, but it's not a consumer product, I guess, right? So it's not something that people go and buy out by themselves. You have a choice of whether to use it or not. You do, you do. Anyways, yeah, that's uh, a good example. Uh, but questions? And we'll just start. I think the microphone will be, will be with you in a second. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Um, here, you guys might not be able to hear. He said it was a great, great talk. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know the, I don't know if the beach ball is working. All right. Karen. I hear you make it seem very simple, uh, choice A, choice B, but in fact it's unlikely that they actually configure the car like that, but they have seven options, uh, pedestrians, children, you, walls, where they say yes, no, yes, no. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated, mm -hmm. right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely it's going to be more complicated. In fact, um, these decisions are all going to be probabilistic. Uh, I guess the point I would make is that these are necessarily stylized, cartoonish scenarios which won't actually emerge. And they're done on, we made them like that on purpose. We made them like that on purpose because you want to actually isolate where the ethical trade-offs are. We want to make it clear to people what they're deciding between. When, and then once we, we decide what the ethical trade-offs are, then you can program a noisy system to react to noisy situations and, and bias towards one thing rather than the other. When, when we drive, these types of accidents will never happen. Uh, you're never going to be in a situation where, oh my god, there's 10 pedestrians in front of you, should I drive off a cliff? I mean, maybe in the trillions of miles that are driven, this happens maybe one or two times. Uh, and so those types of crashes are very rare, but what is happening all the time is we're making these decisions on how to apportion risk, right? So how to just increase by a quarter of a percent the chance that we're going to hit the cyclist rather than the semi. Uh, and so in reality, we are apportioning risk all the time, even if the crashes themselves don't happen. So what we want to do is just clarify, make it clear to people what the ethical trade-offs are and where their ethical commitments lie. We have a question over here. How much did it vary um, by country and cultures? That, that yeah. And, and do we have one car for England and one yeah, that's for a great Germany question. and one for the United States based on our, based on our moral? Um, yeah. Moral it, so it's a challenge because we did see considerable cultural variation and we saw predictable cultural variation. So you can imagine that how cars operate towards jaywalkers is going to be different in Munich than in Mumbai uh, than in Moose Jaw, for instance, right? So these are different places with different norms in different circumstances these cars have to navigate around. In a place like Munich, people don't jaywalk. They don't, they'll just stay there even though there are no cars on the road. Whereas in, 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 in India, people are jaywalking all the time. Uh, so how are the cars going to react to these very different situations? In New York, people are jaywalking all the time. We were just talking about that, right? The, the, some, some, I was talking with somebody over there. Um, so right now, if there is top-down regulation, uh, you'll likely see the European Commission regulate their cars one way, you'll likely see Americans regulate their car another way. Uh, and then people themselves are going to have to change their beha behavior to accommodate these cars, right? So right now we operate with a general uh, intuitive theory of mind about how we understand other drivers are going to operate because we can empathize with other drivers, we know what they're going to operate because we can literally simulate their brains because we have similar brains. But once you have machines making these decisions, now we have, to, we have an entirely new mind that we have to learn how their behavior works. When are they going to stop? Where, what does it mean when they're positioning themselves in a lane? So this is a transition which is going to be messy. Um, in terms of what predicted the variation, so we saw in places that are uh, richer, people seem more committed to utilitarianism. In places which are poorer, people see more variation in terms of not all lives being equal. So in places that are poorer, you see uh, people playing a high, put, putting a higher value on executives and doctors over criminals and homeless people. Uh, they, they, they vary their answers more on age, whereas in places that are richer, they seem to be more 
treating every life equally. And it, it's very different if you're 25 or 30. You just see, I mean, I just where you are in your lifespan has so much to do with how, where you would, what you would injure. Or if John Jones was in my car, or my son was in my car, would I make a different decision? Yeah. The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, yeah. So one thing we can hope is that, well, maybe when we yield our autonomy to these machines, they can operate without some of the biases that we might have. We have lots more questions. A couple over there. Is that mine here? Ah. Right there. I think perhaps uh, the obvious solution for the car manufacturer is to hedge his bet and have a switch on the dashboard which says pedestrian preference versus driver preference. <laughs> yeah, so this has been suggested, the, the ethical knob, that if you really have to make it to the airport, then you just crank it up and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. Uh, what I suspect might happen then is you have these group level effects emerge where there's a race to the bottom. So once you see that anybody is electing to make their car self-protective, that gives you license to do it yourself. You don't want to be the chump that's driving around in a utilitarian car when everybody else is driving around in a self-protective one. And so I, I worry that that's just going to push everything towards, towards the self-protective version. We have a question right behind you, Doug. Oh, oh. Doesn't matter. We'll go in whatever order. No. Kind of going back to what you were saying with uh, the penultimate question, did you look at all at the economic impact of hitting one versus many or kind of like you were saying, higher value targets, did that ever come into play with your research? So what, what, we, what we haven't looked at are things like if you hit an 80-year-old person, uh, they're going to be less likely to survive that impact. If you hit a pedestrian or a cyclist, they're going to be less likely to survive that impact than somebody in a car. When we were developing these scenarios, we made things, again, very black and white uh, in order to isolate the particular trade-off that we're talking about. But in reality, all those other factors are going to have to be taken into account, how vulnerable the person is, right? So if you hit a child, again, more likely to die than if you hit a full-grown 200-pound adult. Over here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, please. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm a student uh, of Master of Public Policy. I would like to know, uh, in your point of view, uh, what would be a, a approach to the government that should address this this problem of the the, the car? What what type of car? Yeah, is better to, so to fit the, the society. And my own personal belief uh, is that you should design the cars to be utilitarian to treat all lives equally, with some allowance for the rule of law. I think that you have to factor in. Uh, uh, some additional punishment, not, not deliberate punishment, so some a greater willingness to sacrifice people who are breaking the law in order to deter people from breaking the law. Otherwise, people are just going to be jaywalking all over the place and the cars won't, won't move. Um, but I think that the cars largely should be programmed to be utilitarian. Uh, I think norms will change. I think right now people are saying that I would not buy a utilitarian car. I would only buy a self-protective car. But I think as this technology rolls out, we will see uh, uh, with greater familiarity, potentially greater comfort with buying cars that are programmed to be utilitarian. The reason why is because if you think about the absolute level of uh, risk of an accident, that is lowering enormously when you buy these cars. Even if it's marginally increasing the relative risk should you find yourself in one of those situations. So it's, it's, it's marginally increasing your risk in a situation when there are trade-offs, but it's enormously decreasing your risk of getting in an accident altogether. And so if you can communicate to, to people about those risks, the problem is that people don't process risk very well. But if you can communicate that risk, then people should be more inclined to get one of these cars, even if it's going to be utilitarian. Jason, we have a couple of questions on this side, here and there. So in terms of a government regulation, um, 
every crosswalk the cars could automatically stop by, you know, over the Wi-Fi, it would tell your car to stop. When emergency vehicle comes, they could automatically get out of the way. Um, you could have utilitarian cost where if you pay more, you get to drive really fast, everybody has to pull aside. I don't know, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of things you could do with self-driving cars with the help or the hindrance of the government. Yeah, so I, I agree. I mean, it, to some degree it requires partnership with the levers of government that control infrastructure, right? So these cars could be made a lot better, a lot faster, if you had partnership and, and speedy uh, upgrading in terms of technology to the infrastructure. Uh, the people I've talked to are skeptical that the government will be able to deal with that. And as a result, they're just, they're just pursuing as if they're not gonna have initially any help from the infrastructure and they just have to design the cars to be as responsive themselves. Um, in, there is a European-American difference that seems to emerge here as well. So the, the European people tend to, and, and the European Commission has come out on this as well, as well as uh, uh, regulators in particular countries, they want to take a more top-down approach. Whereas in America, there seems to be more comfort with a bottom-up, tort-based approach that, well, you'll design a car a certain way and then wait for the lawsuits to come and then adjust as a result. Right here, Jason. So in your initial um, moral machine, you created the narrative where you had a, J a bank robber and a homeless person in the crosswalk. So you give that narrative to the players, if you will. They are then judging that on those bad people, quote, quote. The car is only going to see two human forms. Mm -hmm. It's not going to know what they are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have time to get a dossier on both of those people. <laughs> yes. It could be your mother and your wife, and the car would not know that. So how do you, you know, address that situation? Mm -hmm. It's just going to hit two people. It doesn't yeah. know who they are. Yeah, so, uh, of course, you're right. value is. You're right. The, I mean, the, the moral machine was not meant to be a one-to-one -one representation of what the actual reality is going to look like. It was meant to balance our desire to collect data on the topic with our desire to uh, actually get people to want to play the game, right? So um, when I've talked to the people who design the sensors for these cars about what they're going to be capable of doing, they'll, they say, well, we can distinguish two people from one person, and we can distinguish a small person from a large person. So we could distinguish a six-year-old from a 16-year-old, but we probably can't distinguish a 16-year-old from a 60-year-old. And we certainly can't figure out who's a doctor. Of course, they can't figure out who's a doctor and, and who's a criminal, uh, even if they were carrying that bag of mo money with the dollar sign on it. Um, uh, so, so, yeah. The, and, and moreover, there's going to be no incentive to develop the, the sensors that are able to make those, those distinctions. So, yeah, it's not going to be able to, to, to determine who is a, a doctor and, and a criminal. That was mainly just for the, the game. We have time for one more question right there. Uh, the mic is coming. The mic is coming. Yeah. Uh, your setup is uh, for a car and passengers. How about on the road? It seems more that it's car versus car. Mm -hmm. So, has that been incorporated in your moral machine? So no, uh, not yet. And and it's when I mentioned that the transition is going to be a messy situation. It's be because we're going to have a combination of uh, human-driven cars co co coinciding with self-driven car self cars, and you'll have self-driving cars of different levels of automation, and all that's going to be happening on the streets together, uh, which means that the cars are going to have to be able to predict what human, how humans would drive, and humans are going to have to be able to predict how the cars would act, uh, it would act which is going to be different from how they perceive humans to interact. So that's going to be a challenge. Uh, in terms of particular accidents in terms of uh, distributing risk between uh, other passengers and other cars and uh, 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 the passengers in, in AVs, we haven't looked at that. Uh, I can make some guesses as to what we see, but no, we haven't looked directly at that. We have one last question, sir. I'm a technologist, and from the technologist's point of view, I feel my responsibility is to design the systems that preclude the kind of situations that you had mentioned, and these would be kind of use cases, and uh, so system reliability would be a, a takeaway from, uh, 
from the topic that you talked about today. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, ideally, of course, we want these cars not to have to get into these situations, and we want to minimize the risk altogether. So are you, are you going to close with a prediction? Are we headed towards self-protecting or utilitarian cars? A prediction? I think we'll, I think we'll, go, I think we'll get utilitarian cars. Utilitarian cars. Well, but I'm an optimist. We'll see. Um, I think that this was a wonderful, timely, concise, well-informed talk. And please join me in thanking Professor Sharif. Thanks, guys. <laughs>